All right. So here we are, folks, and we're going to be talking about that thing that seems so gimmicky. Cutting off your blood flow to get bigger and lifting light weights. Um, blood flow restriction training, something that has interestingly uh, invaded kind of the last 10 years of consciousness, especially in the natural bodybuilding community, especially in the natural bodybuilding community aware of research, but of course not restricted to the natural bodybuilding community. Um, but it's one of those things that is, uh, I'd say, counterintuitive. Uh, I think when you see people saying, hey, you can lift light weights, get just as many gains, uh, just need to cut off your circulation to your arms and, and do some pump sets, um, shazam, magic, then people think that's, that can't be right. That's got to be like, you know, some, some kind of weird gimmick. But it's not. And it actually takes advantage of some kind of interesting mechanisms of inducing fatigue locally to result in better muscle recruitment. So today I am joined uh, by none other than uh, Dr. Nicholas Licamelli, DPT, uh, and also uh, my good colleague, Alberto Nunez. And uh, to take it back to the old school, uh, Berto, you and I were back on the boards. And if you don't know what I'm talking about by boards, I don't mean skateboarding, because we're both highly uncoordinated for that type of activity. I mean the bodybuilding.com forums, when, uh, when none other than straight flexed, your boy Lane Norton was probably the first person to introduce blood flow restriction training through, uh, at the time, I believe, master's student, Jeremy Lenicky who is now a, uh, I would argue, a world-renowned researcher in the area of uh, blood flow restriction training. We're talking like mid-2000s, I think, was when that first started popping up. Um, and we first started seeing people going ham on the cables. So when was the first time, Berto, that you tried restricting your blood flow? Well, first of all, since you're Dr. Helms, we have Dr. Licamelli. Um, I'm almost 40. I think I should be called Don Alberto. Or Don, Don Nunez. Don Nunez. Yeah, I'm, I'm down with that. It's a D. So, yeah. Um, it, yeah, we've been around that long, man. I, th I think it was mid-2000s. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to me, because, you know, I love Lane. <laughs> but, you know, Lane's got that side to him. Uh, every, I love every sentence that starts like that. I love Lane, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're both... Uh, man... Uh, yeah, they'd play their Disturbed a little loud, right? A little louder than the rest of us, I think. Mm. Um, On repeat. Uh, so when they started doing this, I'm just like, I'm like, no, man. It's like, what's wrong with like regular lifting? Like, I, I am. And then as he described it, you know, like, oh, it hurts. Like, it, it'll, it'll, you know, see what you really got inside of you. I'm like, I'm like, bro, like, I am, I'm barely surviving this standard weightlifting stuff. I am, I'm cool. Um, but, um, but yeah, it wasn't until shoot like it, it became a something that I, I needed i guess that, that i was like oh okay let me take the time to see what this is really about it made more sense and it, now it's something that is a little bit more normal man but back then man there was a few crazies doing it and uh and that's just, i couldn't hop on it man i couldn't do you remember uh dr joe's initial reaction to when it started to get used and you know none of us had really seen the research because why would we have you know it was yeah, yeah. first it started coming out of japan and then it was always kind of looking at these super physiological kind of, not even yet at the clinical stage, which we'll talk to you about, Nick, in a bit. It was like kind of like bastardized being applied to bodybuilding. And, and early, just because we had access to this researcher, you know, now Dr. Lenicky, who, who happened to be a natural bodybuilder at the time. So I remember Dr. Joe, his reaction was like, that sounds like a great way to throw a clot and, and like <laughs> die. He was like, what's the safety data on this? I've never heard of this. I don't trust this. He was super negative about it. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it was it was a weird time just all of a sudden seeing this come up. And it was one of those things where you could see, like, people were just kind of like, yeah, that's science because they're talking about it. And that's probably not the best way to think. But, I mean, they weren't wrong. It is still around. And now it's got a couple of decades of research behind it. So, so with that, now that we're done reminiscing about... Uh, our, our days on the forums and back when people knew straight flexed more often than they knew uh, Dr. Lane Norton. Nick, talk to me about you as a, a physical therapist and someone who's interested in this from a clinical perspective. How did you come into contact with blood flow restriction training and what was your initial reaction versus what you've learned uh, since you've, your exposure to it? Yeah, so uh, first off, I'm excited about today, dare I say pumped to be here. Mm-hmm. 
Hey. Um, so actually, my yes, I'm a physical therapist and blood flow restriction training has been used clinically, but I was exposed to it the same as you guys. Lane Norton, uh, I was at a phase in my bodybuilding career when I was deep in muscle magazines and everything that I read, I just did. Uh, I, my first blood flow restriction tourniquets or straps or whatever you want to call it, um, it was maybe, oh, this big for people on YouTube and people not on YouTube, maybe about a half of an inch. And so I just tied that sucker, <laughs> tied that sucker up on my arm, um, did a couple curls, didn't go to the gym yet because it wasn't quite too confident, didn't want to seem like I didn't know what I was doing, uh, of course, right? And then um, so did a couple curls in my basement, my my uh, my hand started uh, <laughs> turning colors, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. took the tourniquets off, I had the one of the greatest, obviously, pumps of my life. Um, and uh, had bruises on my arms for the next uh, week and a half. So that was my first ex- exposure to uh, blood flow restriction training. That's how you but know it was working, one- Nick. Exactly. <laughs> it was one of those things that just kept popping up. And it it soon became clear that maybe this is something different. Um, and one of the things, one of the reasons why, to me, it doesn't it seem like a hack or like another one of these trends that's going to come and go is because all it is is based off of principles of muscular adaptation. Like it's not changing anything. It, all it is 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 accelerating processes that already exist. Mm-hmm. So one of the ways that I like to frame anything that comes across, uh, I guess, my my face in bodybuilding or physical therapy, you have to make sure that we know the difference between principles and methods, right? This is not the first time that I've, I've talked about this. Um, Methods are many, principles are few, as the saying goes. So a principle is like turning a screw to the right, it goes in, turning a screw to the left, it comes out. A method is everything else that comes after that. So when it comes to blood flow restriction, all we're doing is just creating that metabolic stress and that hypoxic environment or, or, uh, poor oxygen supply locally. Um, So in general, before we kind of get into the weeds clinically, the benefit of something like BFR would be uh, patients who can't load their tissues quite as heavy, uh, heavy enough to get adaptation, whether it be hypertrophy or strength, tying this tourniquet or cuff around the limb um, would allow to get the patient to get similar benefits with a fraction of the weight necessary. So that's really the benefit when clinically, even passively, just the patient lying there, uh, having the cuff inflated for five minutes on, a few minutes off, five minutes on, um, has been shown to reduce atrophy post-surgery and things like that. So in general, that's the clinical uh, importance of that is that we can allow patients who can't load their tissues adequately to use lighter weight and get similar uh benefits. Mm-hmm. So let, let's take even even one more step back, Nick, like, uh, let's, let's, let's not assume that someone even knows anything about BFR. You know, I, I think it's easy for me and Berto and, and you, like, like you said, to, because of our history with this unique, small niche corner of the lifting world um, of mid 2000s natural bodybuilding. Um, but I know there's a lot of people who weren't around at that time, weren't focused on it, weren't, you know, have come come to it earlier, later, or maybe just were never really part of that scene. If you had to give the elevator pitch to somebody, let's say, you know, you're in an elevator and that's where elevator pitches have to occur. Someone (laughs) walks in and they're like, Hey, you know, why are you doing curls with those, uh, BFR wraps around your arms? Um, their second question would be, why are you doing curls in an elevator at all? But just answer the first question to start. (laughs) Like what they don't have any idea what blood flow restriction training is. What is it? Yeah. So blood flow restriction training is, the this method of training where we wrap some kind of wrap or tourniquet or cuff around our limb we pump it up to restrict partially restrict arterial flow completely restrict venous outflow and we work that muscle as we work that muscle some of the normal processes that happen under normal resistance training are enhanced we get to fatigue faster and we can get similar results with less weight that's basically the gist of it. 
And I imagine that's actually a conversation you have to have in your clinic. If you use BFR with someone who's not doing it for sports performance or recovery from the inability to do sports performance because of a joint injury, if you've got, you know, someone who is, you know, doing physical therapy exercises to recover from injury, who's not a bodybuilder, they probably have never heard of BFR, I'd imagine. So you probably explain this to people kind of just quote unquote off the street numerous times. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And one of the with those patients who perhaps aren't bodybuilders or, or have been in, in the gym much in their life, BFR can prepare that person for heavier loads. So it mm-hmm. can it can expose the person to what a muscle burn feels like. It can expose the person to dealing with discomfort uh, with light loads and usually something like a, you know a single joint movement rather than getting under a barbell and having to explain to someone that burning you feel in your quads, it's okay. Like when you feel that burning, you have to breathe in, breathe out, keep your composure and keep going and do another rep and do another rep. And it's going to get worse and worse and worse, but you can kind of breathe through it and you can work through that. BFR is a great way to expose someone to that feeling if they've never felt that before with light loads. Yep. You know, Berto, I was thinking about when there came to be a little more general acceptance of BFR as a potential methodology and less pushback. And I think it was right around the time that we collectively decided, okay, maybe light weights for high reps close to failure are just as good as like moderate weights. Like we don't have to only train in the like heavy or no more than 12 rep range. Like I think once, you know, some of the work became highly recognized, I would say, you know, do credit to Dr. Schoenfeld and also Stu Phillips, they did a lot of work and some meta-analyses that looked at basically low load training near to failure, as most research is. It doesn't have to be to failure, but that's just the way we standardize effort in in, in most resistance training studies. Finding similar outcomes uh, when you match volume or match number of sets for hypertrophy. Now, all of a sudden, people are thinking, oh, okay, well, BFR, you're supposed to take like your shit. You start with like your 40 rep max on your first set, and then you do like three sets of 15 with a short rest interval. All right, well, well, shoot, I guess if you can grow from sets of 20 to 30 to failure, I guess BFR, maybe it sort of does make sense. And it's just short-circuiting that process. It's helping you get to those fatigued reps a little earlier. So I, I remember that's around the time, because I didn't actually start doing BFR until 2011. So it was probably three, four years before I wanted to start playing with it or I thought about trying it out. And, and, and like you guys, I did it way too tight. Mm-hmm. Did it for basically <laughs> max max tightness I can get out of my bands and max discomfort, and it had purple arms and shit like that. And I did that yeah. like regularly, um, yeah. Until I actually came across the research suggesting that my actually could be counterproductive. <laughs> <laughs> so so anyway, yeah. Would you agree that's kind of around when we started to see greater acceptance of it, Bruno? Yeah, it took a few years, eh? Right, mm. it took a few years. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you said, we initially did it wrong. I remember you in your living room with your it was your wrist wraps is what we what you yep. used, right? And 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 it's like, I'm like, man, that looks wrong. But you know what? Fuck it, science. Yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, okay. right. Uh, and, and it kind of became kind of a badge of honor, right? In some ways, because it was it was tough in its own way. Um, but nevertheless, once we got that sorted out, and it got to the point where it's like, okay, you know, like we were on the one to ten scale, like six, seven, like you know, right around there. Um, it started to feel a lot more like just standard resistance training. It was just weird. Like there's few things that are like a, a actual hack, but this felt like a hack because you look at the load, you look at you know how quickly that all happened basically, and you're like, wow, this feels like I did a you know standard series of sets with uh, with a you know more traditional um, weight training. Um, so I think it took that. It took that like to just try it yourself, see that okay. It just feels like lifting weights. And then you learn a little bit more about how things work. And it's like, oh, you know, when we are training, like this kind of sort of happens. This just kind of expedites the the, the, the process, basically. Um, and then for me, I know that it just really became something useful and something that I just had to learn to, to apply to my training um, because it was it was very... It came in handy whenever maybe my elbows weren't feeling were feeling not so good. Uh, whenever maybe I was a few weeks out from a powerlifting meet, and I'm like, look, I'm all wrecked from like that big lifting. Like, this is super convenient right now because I don't have to use as much weight. I don't feel more wrecked at a 
uh, connective tissue level afterwards. Um, and that's how I was sold on it. It just became something that I would pull out um, a little bit more frequently than I honestly ever thought I, I would have to. Mm -hmm. So you whipped it out more often than you expected. I can totally understand that. Um, yeah, I, I, I specifically remember being, like you said, the old house, doing it in the living room. I remember uh, being on a walk. Maybe it was for my 2011 contest prep. Not sure. And I called up Peter Fitchin, Dr. Peter Fitchin, who is also someone who, during the course of his graduate work, did some research on BFR. And I was asking him about it. And I think just to kind of give the perspective of what happens when you take something and you have bodybuilders do it and they make it unnecessarily hard and painful. Yes. Um, he was talking about a grant proposal where he was describing the discomfort people can feel during BFR training. And one of the reviewers um, was like, you know, we've used it in our lab and we don't get many reports of that. And, and Peter and I were like, I don't know what the hell they're talking about, you know? And I think when you ask a bodybuilder to do like a seven out of 10 tightness, yeah. 10 is a 10 and yeah. 7 out of 10 is 7 out of 10. You know what I'm saying? It's not like yeah. <laughs> someone yeah. who has yeah. no, you know, you know, prior experience with 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 pain from training and maybe that's a different pain threshold. And I'm sure, Nick, I, I've seen there's been various opinions about the validity of these like pain scales and maybe the negative consequences of, of priming people for it, like the nocebo effect. But I think there's probably a big difference between someone who is dieted down for a show doing a 7 out of 10 tightness and someone who's never lifted weights before being told to make this a 7 out of 10 tightness. I think they'd probably be like a 4 or a 5 for us. But anyway, um, we were talking about it and that was the first time I was like, maybe I'm not doing this right. <laughs> like, Maybe I'm making this this far too tight. And I remember feeling like, I don't know if this is hard enough anymore because it just kind of feels yes. like I'm, again, like you said, Berto, when I started doing it correctly and I did that subjective 7 out of 10 tightness and I started using you know, like knee wraps instead of my wrist wraps, which can only be a 10 out of 10 tightness because they barely fit around your arm. <laughs> um, did I think this, this isn't that bad. Like I was really getting myself psyched up to be in pain mm -hmm. and like jumping out of your, <laughs> you know, the leg extension as soon as it's <laughs> over. And then it was just kind of like, all right, I can use this more and more regularly. Um, so I did a full stint of it in 2011. I just did it constantly because I wanted to just try it out to get the experience. But then there was a period um, actually during my PhD, I got a really banged up elbow in 2016 from plate loading for my study that I did out with uh, Dr. Zerdos and FAU. And, um, I had like tendonitis for like a year after that in my elbow. And I was like, you know what? I'm not doing any arm work unless it's BFR. Just, I want to unload the tissue and, you know, like knock on wood, I have not had nearly as bad tendonitis since. And it's something that I know I can, like you, um, pull out at any time point if I want to be able to reduce the load by like 60% on what I normally do for any kind of arm work while still getting a pretty good stimulation. So it's one of those things that I'm just glad it's in my toolbox. It's absolutely not the end all be all or any kind of gimmick, even though it does seem like a gimmick in some cases, but um, it's a pretty cool tool. There's a lot of pulling out and whipping out going on uh, in this mm -hmm. podcast, but mm -hmm. I just want to talk about the pressure that we're supposed to apply to our limbs, if that's cool. Um, yep. Yeah. So basically uh, the seven out of 10, <laughs> the seven out of 10, <laughs> Um, is what's called practical BFR. So it's the quick and dirty way of doing it. Um, as far so limb occlusion pressure is the amount of tightness that we apply to our limbs. So uh, complete limb occlusion would be um, where it cuts off arterial flow. So think of that like the systolic blood pressure. Like if you're taking a systolic blood, uh, taking a manual blood pressure, you pump it up with the stethoscope on the person's arm and you hear the pulse. But then when you get to that point where you pump it up enough, you don't hear the pulse anymore. And then you let it out slowly, slowly, slowly. And then bloop, you hear that little blub. That right there is LOP. So now mm. in the research, they do percentages of LOP. So for the legs, they say between 60 and 80% of that pressure for the arms, it's 40 to 50%. Um, now, we don't need to do that um, for it to be safe or effective. But if we are trying to conduct studies on these on this type of training, it just makes sense to to standardize it across the board so everyone has kind of an even playing field. They've done different ways of of trying to do that with maybe just like certain amount of pressures across the board. Um, but that didn't really everyone's arms are different. 
people have different amounts of adipose tissue, people have different sizes of their arms. So um, the percentage of LOP is pretty much the standard um, standard way to do that. The My, my experience with it, uh, I, I've n- I, only until recently have I actually done the, a, actually pumped it up with a cuff with a pump on it um, mm. to, to a certain mark. Um, holding on, you know, feeling the pulse when it stops and then kind of doing a percentage of that. And I've never felt anything like that in my life. I, the, the pump and the, and the burn, I felt muscles in my quads. I think I know the anatomy of the thigh pretty well. I was feeling muscles. I didn't even know that were in there. Um, so it, it definitely is different, um, with like something like a knee wrap versus an actual cuff with like a pump on it. Hmm. Uh, but again, we we realize that there's a wide range of pressures that can be used. Um, so I guess for the listener, the, the takeaway would be if, if all you have is a 7 out of 10 rating, you can use it. Just know that just like a 7 out of 10 pain scale, that could be skewed by the amount of sleep you got the last night or how yeah. recovered you are or your stress levels. Um, it's a perception, right? It's like RPE. You're, you can rate the same workout differently depending on how you're feeling that day and, and a bunch of other factors. So anytime there's a rating, a, a subjective perception rating, whether it's seven out of 10 tightness or a pain scale, there's going to be some inconsistencies day to day. And if, if we're trying to progress our blood flow restriction training, um, whether it be weights or pressure from session to session, it's going to be tougher to do that if we're doing a seven out of 10. But again, if that's all you have, you're still going to get some benefits from tying something around your limb, feeling your pulse, making sure that it's still there. You don't want to, um, if you don't feel your pulse, that means that you're including arterial flow as well, which is not what we want. Um, so you can feel the pulse in your hand, in your wrist, like, classic way to take your pulse or down near your ankle. You can also kind of get a pulse um, down there. Real quickly, just want to kind of explain the difference between arterial flow and venous flow, just in case anyone doesn't really know what we're talking about. When the heart pumps um, blood to the to the body, it is oxygen-rich blood that it pumps out with a ton of force out into the arteries of our body. So that blood is high velocity. It's flowing with a lot of force. It goes um, from the heart and then into your limbs. As it as the arteries go further and further to your extremities, they get smaller and smaller and smaller until the oxygen nutrients that the blood are carrying goes over the um, blood vessel membranes and it goes into the venous system. And then just the opposite, the veins start very small at the extremities and they get bigger and bigger and bigger as they go back to the heart. So the velocity of that blood flow in the veins is much slower than it was going out there. So when we apply pressure to a limb, that arterial flow is able to pass by because it's got that force going with it, has an oxygen-rich blood, nutrient-rich blood that's going to our tissues. But the pressure then allows that venous blood to pool because that's much slower. um, And that's where we're getting, that's where we're getting that pump. So that's a difference between Um, arterial flow and venous flow and why we don't want to restrict arterial flow um, when we're trying to work a muscle because we want the we want that blood uh, to get to our muscles to to work and then we want those metabolites in there uh, to kind of build up and not leave and uh, so that's just kind of a basic uh, review of of what that even means arterial arterial flow and venous flow and why we don't want to occlude arterial flow well, I'm actually really glad you you went down that though those basics, Nick, because if for those who were around, you know, when this first started, mm. everyone used to call it occlusion training back in the day. And like you said, LOP, limb limb occlusion pressure. Um, that's probably what we were doing in the bodybuilding community was <laughs> occluding just as much as we possibly could. Um, and uh, you just explained why we have now moved towards blood flow restriction training because we're not completely occluding the limb, and it doesn't make sense to do that. Um, and it helps us understand that, yeah, we're actually still getting oxygen delivered to the limb, even though it feels like we're getting this massive pump, there's more pain. Um, and some of the 
and correct me if I'm wrong here, Nick, some of the benefits uh, and, the, and the mechanism by which this is working is that we're actually not able to clear out some of the metabolites at the same speed. Um, so while we can get the blood flow through, it'll be at, at a slightly restricted rate. So there is some limitation of how much, uh, you know, oxygen is being delivered. It is, you know, a partially ischemic condition. Um, we're, when all of the byproducts of the metabolic byproducts of training are around longer. So you get what's called more autocrine and paracrine time for binding. So one of the proposed mechanisms by which, uh, you know, BFR is, is supposedly inducing hypertrophy is because of all of the metabolites that we think are related to fatigue, that it can induce, at the very least, uh, enhanced muscle fiber recruitment uh, as certain other fibers, uh, you know, drop out, uh, but are creating all these sites for binding and signaling for hypertrophy and, and anabolism. Uh, and they're hanging around longer because they can't get out. So so am I, am I speaking out of my butt or is that a decent... Uh, representation of some of the theory behind this. Yeah, perfect. And you mentioned the fiber types. So, and Eric, I talked to you about this too. You helped me kind of get some clarity around it. We, one of the uh, things that happens with BFR is that we, we see um, early recruitment of type two muscle fiber. So in general, we have two types of fibers, type one, type two, type one fibers are fatigue resistant um, they are called upon first and then the type two fibers, uh, are called upon second if, if we need them. And the type two fibers are highly fatigable. Um, type two fibers have uh, the ability to produce more power than type one, but that's not to be confused with force. So power is velocity dependent. So type one fibers are not so great at doing like quick explosive movements, but they can produce a decent amount of force. Type 2 fibers can produce the same amount of force as type 1, but they're just quicker and more explosive. So think of a sprinter or a, a, a shot putter or someone like that. They would, if they could wave a magic wand, they would want more type 2 fiber uh, development than type 1. But any person who's, a, who's in any kind of uh, slow, controlled weightlifting uh, environment, bodybuilder, powerlifter, that person is going to want both types of fibers to grow and develop because for hypertrophy, we obviously want as many fibers growing as possible. And same thing with powerlifting. Um, when, so the way that they are recruited, if you could think of, so if I'm holding a, a pencil and I raise my arm up, uh, do like a bicep curl with, with a pencil, it's not um, efficient for my body to call upon every fiber of my bicep to pull that pencil up because then I'm going to fatigue out my bicep if a grizzly bear walks in the room and I have to defend myself, right? So what it does is it only uses as much as it needs. So if it's something light like a pencil, it's going to use those fatigue resistant type one fibers um, that are going to keep me bending my elbow with that pencil and the type two fibers are not going to be recruited. If we think about getting under a bar in a squat rack, say I am going for failure at, at 10 reps and my first two reps, I, I'm not calling, I'm not tapping into all of those fibers, the type two fibers, because I can handle it. It's like the pencil. But then as I go closer and closer to failure, now my body is saying, okay, we need, we need reinforcements here. We need more, we need more uh, people helping out here to, to pull on this muscle, to lift this bar up off of, off of the, off of the ground or, or whatever lift you're doing. So that's when those type two fibers um, and high threshold motor units get recruited when we get closer to failure or if we lift a heavy weight. So we talked about a pencil. If I go to lift um, you know, a one rep max deadlift, it's going to really recruit all of those muscle fibers because it needs to, because it's heavy. So the way that we can get into those muscle fibers, uh, all of those muscle fibers, type one and type two, is by getting close to failure or by lifting heavy loads. BFR allows us to do that um, with with lighter loads. So it's not that there's it's not that we only want to isolate type two fibers. We want to get all of our fibers growing. And the way that we can't we can't do that unless we tax our system enough where it calls upon all those fibers. If that makes sense. Hmm. Absolutely, I think it's a great description. Um, and yeah, I, I think uh, if you understand that restricting blood flow induces earlier fatigue, 
you can understand how even though you're lifting light weights, uh, but you're achieving fatigue earlier, that means those fibers are going to be called upon. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And that is probably the most well-established mechanism by which uh, blood flow restriction training works. It's essentially a shortcut for high rep training. And what I think a lot of people don't understand is that when you are doing um, bodybuilding training, even without uh, cuffs, the actual contraction of the muscle itself creates some level of, of, of a blood flow restriction. And that is part of the reason why you do feel a burn uh, and why you do fatigue at a certain point. Of course, there's, there's other reasons you, you would fatigue regardless. Um, but it certainly is uh, blood flow restriction and, and partial occlusion occurs just with regular training for high reps. And which is, and, and actually, to be honest, it occurs even for low reps. It just doesn't continue on long enough to induce that similar kind of effect. Right. So if anyone out there wants these, these great, uh, fairy tale uh, benefits of, of blood flow restriction. Uh, I say that tongue in cheek, obviously, um, but you don't have cuffs or anything to wrap your limbs with. Do some my reps, do some drop sets, um, do some tempo work. Uh, think of a um, like uh, like um, a sissy squat or even like a leg press or hack squat and just don't stop moving. Don't let your muscles mm -hmm. relax just to have a nice, slow, five-second eccentric and then pop right before, you know, come right back up and then right back down and right back up. Set a metronome uh, in, on your phone or something and and just have that constant flow of up and down and up and down and just don't let your muscle stop contracting and you've achieved basically the same oxidative st stress that we're talking about here at BFR. Yeah, that that the kind of is ischemic stress from from creating muscle contraction, which engorges the muscle and starts to actually occlude some of the uh, the, the veins and veins and arterial outlets is is exactly what that whole constant tension style of training that we see a lot of bodybuilders train with accomplishes. So yeah, uh, but that said, I really do think that BFR is a lot more more practical. You can kind of just train, um, and you don't have to do forty plus reps you know, necessarily with, with a similar load while well, you do in that first set. But, um, I find it, it just is a lot easier. It is basically just a shortcut. Hey guys, it's Andrea Valdez popping in here to let you all know that if you like this discussion, you definitely want to be a member of the 3DMJ vault because Nick is actually creating a whole entire BFR video course and presentation that will be available to vault members this summer. If you're listening to this in the future, it might already be there in our free courses section, so check that out. But if you're listening to this in real time, April 2021, make sure you have signed up at 3dmjvault.com to get instant access to all those free courses and some free preview chapters of our paid courses. Again, that's 3dmjvault.com to watch exclusive videos and be notified when new free courses like this upcoming BFR course release in the future. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the rest of the show. Berto, you actually have written a number of blog posts about it for 3DMJ, um, and you've used it pretty extensively in coaching and for yourself. Where do you find yourself playing this card most often in a, in a coaching position? And, and what are some of the, I guess, the in the trenches experiences you've had uh, that, that may not be reflected in kind of the more mechanistic discussions we've had thus far? Well, the most common one is probably similar to your elbows, right? And say, like, mm. hey, this uh, this joint hurts. <clears throat> it's like, well, time to pull out the wraps, and uh, and we'll we, we'll work it that way. Um, so that's that's probably the most common one. Uh, Power lifters closer to a meet, uh, where it's like, hey, you know, loads are picking up a little bit, uh, things are getting a little bit achy. Um, let's go ahead and do that with some of our single joint assistance movements. Um, the other one, uh, sometimes just like, uh, actually just like traveling. That's a big one for me. You know, um, it's, it's, uh, you don't, you don't, you can, so you have a hotel room gym. This is what you have to work with. Um, it's, it saved my butt a number of times. And then in more recent times with, uh, the whole pandemic, I think that's when it, it was a big win for blood flow restriction because a lot of people, you know, they had no choice. They saw the utility in it. Um, and I know for me, all I had was a 40 pound kettlebell. Like that was, that was what I had to work with in a few bands here. Um, and it, it helped me make it a little bit more, 
Well, it was either do the BFR thing or I'm doing split squats. they are going to be like sets of 50 to 60. So it was an easy buy-in for me. Um, split squats so, is basically a, a taboo bad word at this point. Oh, pandemic. yeah. yeah. Everyone just yeah, got mad No right one's doing those. You it. will get kicked out of the gym if, if you do split squats. <laughs> How dare you come to the gym to do split squats? Um, so that's uh, – I know with my athletes, it's like, okay, so what do you have to lift with? Okay. Yeah, big can of tomato. Okay, like, we'll go ahead and use that thing. So, um, so yeah, uh, especially during the pandemic, I think now a lot more people are running around with this, uh, this, this tool, and mm-hmm. um, and at some point it's going to come up. Like, shoot, we're we're Eric, you and I, we're in our late thirties. Like, I can with every passing decade, I can see us like bringing out this hack just a little bit more and more you know for the, for the record you're 38 i'm 37 yeah. so i'm still in my mid 30s hey talk um, to me next month bud okay yeah well <laughs> we're not there yet so we'll, we'll have a discussion in in, in three weeks <laughs> but 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 yeah man it's uh it's uh it's just it's a little bit more normalized now and i think mm-hmm. once you give it a go if you're familiar with what strength training feels like you're like oh this is Kind of sort of the way I feel after like regular split squats. Um, yep. And uh, and honestly, for me now, it's gotten to the point where um, I'm pretty good at just kind of standardizing like the tightness to what I think is appropriate. Because usually it's like that first set feels kind of normal-ish. Like that's usually how I know. Um, and then it's everything after that that you're like, oh, wow, this this is this is sneaky, sneaky. Uh, but like anything else, you know, getting some practice with it, I, I don't think it's a bad thing, even if you don't necessarily, necessarily need it right now. At some point, most likely everyone everyone will. I like your description of it being kind of sneaky, sneaky, because when well, when you wrap it wrong, like we used to, it's out of 10, like it starts oh, turning right away. Like your third rep. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It was like, um, don't talk to me. Don't talk to me. I'm BFRing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's stupid. When you do it right, though, like that first set basically feels like you did a like a high rep set that wasn't that hard, you know, like 30, 40 reps. And then I notice on the rest interval, like you only rest 30 to 60 seconds. Like I'm 30 seconds into the rest interval and it doesn't feel like I'm resting. It just kind of felt like that. Yeah. I still feel like I do right after that last rep. I'm like, yeah, oh, this isn't good. Like now I got to do another set. (laughs) But uh, it's funny how I had read a fair amount of papers about BFR and I understood the mechanisms and people talking about it and others using it. But I think just like most humans, the quote unquote proof in the pudding didn't occur for me until I really saw it in action among bodybuilders. And when they were kind of forced to use it and I knew it wasn't just confounding variables. Um, Or no, I may be misremembering, but I think it was Arnold Weldon who had a back injury. Oh, yes, yes. I want to say it was like 2013 or 2014. Yeah, yeah. Um, I may have the dates wrong a little bit. So Arnold, if you're listening, apologies. But anyway, we've, we've talked about Cynthia Weldon, one of the most you know, gifted bodybuilders out there. This this is her brother. So yeah, it runs in the family, folks. Um, and he has a great pair of wheels on him. And he had a back injury to where he couldn't squat or deadlift for, I think, most of his prep. And he may have even had yeah. an ouchie in his knee. But I think all he did was blood flow restricted, leg extensions, leg curls, and then hip thrusts. And he showed up, and I think he won his pro card that year. Am I wrong? He did win overall. I think it might have been that NGA overall. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Yep. So he, he looked fantastic. Um, apologies if I'm, if I'm forgetting the results or, or misrepresenting anything, Arnold. But I think that the take home was just that I saw a bodybuilder who did nothing that is traditionally thought to result in keeping your mass, having an impressive set of wheels and just did what he could. And you have you'd have no idea. Like if you saw the guy on stage and like, mm-hmm. yeah, that, that guy doesn't squat or deadlift. You'd be like, good times, funny jokes. Cool story, bro. You know, but it's like, yeah. no, seriously, like for the last six months, he's been dieting and doing cardio and then lifting weights that your grandmother could do. So it's, it's, it, it was, it was pretty impressive. And I think that's when I was like, okay, you know, which is funny considering I'd read like 14 peer reviewed papers and that's what it took to convince me. Um, but, um, but yeah, well, it was, it was in the so hypocaloric state too, like, which yes. makes it all that much more impressive. You know, I think Agreed. when, when you're eating enough, it's kind of, not fair how easy it is to maintain muscle, mm-hmm. you know, but like he was shredded, shredded, and yeah. he kept everything. It seemed like absolutely. So yeah, I, I I remember. I'm just kind of recalling how I how I got to where I am today, where it's kind of just a known quantity. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So yeah. Um, so that, that's really, I appreciate that, Berto. Yeah, I think we, we get an idea of how we use it in the case of sports performance. Nick, what have you learned? I know you recently did, just to give a shout out to the other Dr. Nick, Dr. Nick Rolnick, who has done a lot of work. Well, he's done both peer-reviewed work on this, but he's also um, created some courses and does a lot of work for other PTs and practitioners on how to use BFR in the clinical setting. Um, what have been your revelations as of late on how to use this as a healthcare practitioner uh, and as a physical therapist? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Nick has great, great content. Um, we've kind of teamed up to, to make some, uh, make some cool stuff coming down the pipe, but his course is really great. I think it kind of bridges the, it's, it's good for clinicians. It's good for everyday athletes. It, it kind of has enough science, but enough um, you know, English, <laughs> easy, easily understandable, um, conceptual information, but yeah, at the clinical, uh, level really it is. So if we think about a person post operatively, say an ACL repair, th the period of immobility uh, or immobilization after surgery is when atrophy happens, when loss of strength happens, um, and by applying this BFR passively to someone post-operatively, um, we can reduce that. And then we start at a different level when we're able to load uh, that lower extremity than we would have otherwise. Um, even when the person is able to weight bear post-operatively, we still can't put adequate load into the quadriceps to, to load it with traditional training. So BFR would help us bypass that. We would still get those strength adaptations, those hypertrophy adaptations um, without loading the joint or compromising the graft that was just repaired. Um, it's not dissimilar to an athlete, right? If, if an athlete um, comes to me with, with pain, uh, say, say knee pain, right? Uh, there's always, we always try to find that, that, that variable that is causing the pain or how we can work around it. Um, for those people that just can't tolerate load for some reason, uh, BFR is fantastic because then we just drop the load, put on some BFR, and we can maintain those same uh, training effects um, uh, as we would have lifting heavy. Um, but so really it's the same, it's really the same principles clinically than, than in, uh, you know, than with, with athletes and it can, it can be used. There are studies with elderly populations where it improves, uh, functional tasks like, um, five times sit to stand tests or timed up and go tests where the patient stands up, walks, uh, 10 feet, comes back and sits down. Um, we've seen improvements in bone density. Um, so a wide range of, uh, of uses clinically, even pain modulation. There, there's some research that it can help modulate pain. Again, we talked about the limitations of someone rating their pain uh, before or after uh, a treatment, especially a treatment that hurts a lot. <laughs> so it's almost like uh, similar to like foam rolling, how uh, if you have a four out of 10 pain on your IT band and then you roll it to an 11 out of 10 pain, and then you stop rolling it. It's like, ah, this yeah. four doesn't feel that bad anymore. <laughs> so I think there there could be some of that going on with some of the pain modulation modulation research, um, where they have uh, patients do a functional task like step down off of a step or perform a deep single leg squat, rate their pain, and then do some knee extensions with BFR, and then they do that functional task again and rate their pain again. Limitations to the setup of that kind of study, but whatever the mechanism is, if it can help modulate someone's pain to help them load the tissue more comfortably, it gets the job done. Or I don't care if you wave a magic wand over me, if I'm able to load my knee after you do it, great. Just don't tell me a false narrative about what you're doing. <laughs> um, so yeah, definitely the, the two worlds definitely uh, overlap um, quite a bit. And, and one of the other great benefits or, or uses of it for uh, for the athletic population would be something like a deload, but a, a, a deload where, so if, if someone is taking a deload because they just feel burnt out, they have been pushing RPE and they just need to take a deload to kind of recuperate, I wouldn't recommend BFR because that's going to continue 
to pound that yeah. same system with intensity or uh, not in intensity, but uh, proximity to failure and, and going there and pushing that and, and uh, living through the burn. Um, but if someone needs a, a deload from load, perhaps, um, this would be a perfect situation because you can get that deload effect, but you don't have to stop getting the benefit of heavy loading. Um, and, uh, and even uh, power lifters. So why would a power lifter want to do BFR? Well, typically, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there are phases of a power lifters training. It's not strictly sh one rep max training. You're going to have some hypertrophy blocks. You're going to have some skill technique blocks and then some heavier loading. So the, we know the components of strength hypertrophy is just one of them. Um, skill, the neuro patterning, um, the, the, the arousal state of the person, right? All of these things are going to contribute to strength. Hypertrophy is just one of those things. But if we are, if we're in that hypertrophy phase, um, BFR could be something that, that that's used. And then if we, um, if we've kind of tapped out those other components of strength, um, we have our technique down. Um, you know, we've, we've been doing this for a while. We, we have our, uh, soft tissue and connective tissues have adapted to the powerlifting training. Um, we, we've, we've accomplished all of those things. Hypertrophy is now the most modifiable, uh, variable of our strengthening. So BFR can be used to, to, um, to kind of, uh, cash in on, on that hypertrophy for, a power lifter. But at the end of the day, I, I feel like it, it, it's been too long into this podcast before we said this. Um, if you can train heavy, train heavy. BFR is not a replacement for traditional training uh, for hypertrophy or strength, but it, it could be a supplement. And that's kind of this nuanced conversation that we're having of different ways that we can use it. So it's not going to replace traditional training. If you can train heavy, train heavy. BFR can be used like like we're talking about could be uh, in our back pocket if we need it or if um, you know if, if we want to give it a shot for any of the reasons we're talking about. That's that's great, Nick. And and yeah, actually you're right. We should, I should have covered that earlier. <laughs> and uh, just to give some people some broad outcome based stuff, like if you look at the latest meta analyses that look at BFR versus traditional training on both hypertrophy and strength, you will see that BFR training does increase strength. Uh, but it does not do so to the same uh, effect size as traditional training, which is done with heavier loads. However, I have yet to see an analysis that shows when you're looking at a bird's eye view of the broad data that traditional training is actually better than BFR for hypertrophy or vice versa. So for, for the physiological rationale that we described before, they are equivalent in terms of uh, getting you know local muscle hypertrophy, which, which is wild, which I think is cool. Um, and I think when you think about periodization and when you think about the inevitable injuries that athletes get, um, you can think about the applications of BFR um, generally. So there are time periods where it's important to be less specific. We'll go back to your example of being a power lifter, Nick. Um, it's really hard to train heavy all the time as a power lifter. And the strategies which do leverage an approach which try to keep it heavy have to make sacrifices in other areas. Like if you want to do con singles consistently, sometimes those RPEs on those singles are low. Sometimes you're still lifting heavy objectively, like 85% of 1RM for a single, but it's just a single, which is like a 5 RPE. And then the overall volume is low and the uh, overall frequency is moderate. So you want to use a quote unquote Bulgarian-esque, but still functional style of training, not one that'll just put you in a body bag. Uh, you have to modulate the other, other variables. Um, but if you're using a more traditional approach, let's say you're not doing the singles, uh, and let's say maybe you've, you've got some lingering injuries that didn't actually prevent you from competing, but let's say you're, you know, USAPL, you did your regional meet, uh, you went and competed in nationals. Uh, let's say it's a normal year, not, not the pandemic. So it's October and you're like, you know what? I really just do not have it in me to train like a traditional power lifter. And I also don't need to. My next meet isn't until April or May next year. And then I'm not going to compete again until nationals after that. So what am I going to do in November, December, and let's even say January? Well, you're probably going to do uh, kind of this 
deceleration of, of, of the stress, you're going to drop that off, and you're going to start building back up. Uh, and what this normally looks like is people doing like sets of eight at 60% of one RM and sets of eight at 65, that's sets of eight at 70%. They're really far from failure. Um, and as a, as a hypertrophy stimulus, that's, that's okay. It's certainly better than doing, you know, like five by three at 80% or something like that. Um, but a, as is often the case, you're already being pretty nonspecific, right? You might be doing, you know, high bar, you might be doing low load multi-rep sets. Um, so that is already pretty, I mean, yeah, it's a squat, but it's not a competition squat. It's not a first, second, or, or certainly not a third attempt load. So why not? at certain phases, especially if it means you can drop the load even lower since you're already non-specific. At this point, whether you're doing sets of eight at 65% or 40%, it probably is not gonna matter in April when you do a one RM squat, but it may allow you to take 80 pounds off the bar, give your spine a little more of a break, and you can chuck on those BFR wraps and get a similar stimulus to the muscles while still doing a very close movement pattern. So I, I, think, I think there's a lot of value in that. And it, it can even, it can enable you to have less of a trade-off while really recycling that load. Because I tell you what, sometimes, you know, when you're really beat up, you may be able to squat 500 pounds, but 315 feels like garbage, you know? And that is actually a pretty low percentage of your 1RM. And how nice would it be just to, to not even have to do it? I mean, that's the whole rationale that people use other variations of squats. You know, they do high bar, they do safety bar. Yeah, it challenges the movement pattern a little differently. It's a nice counter to, you know, to folding forward. It may be a little more quad dominant. But a lot of the times, the variations we use in powerlifting are just a way to keep it hard by reducing load. And that's essentially what BFR does. So, yeah, I think early on when I was using this as a coach or thinking about uh, the practical applications, powerlifting, I kind of had off the table. And I thought about, you know, this is really just a bodybuilding tool. It's great for single joint movements when you have pain. But I would say while that is a great and more obvious application, I would totally agree with you, Nick, that I think it has to have a lot of other applications as well beyond just uh, those, those niche cases. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's really well said. And, and Eric, I would encourage everyone to, um, if you aren't subscribed to Mass, subscribe to Mass. But your um, your piece on um, specificity, that was uh, really a game changer for me. Helped me organize my thoughts a little bit. Specificity of load, specificity of rep range, specificity of movement. Um, it's not just you want to get better at the competition squat, do the competition squat. There is a bit of a gray area there, especially when we talk about skill of different movements. Um, so yeah, definitely, uh, if, if you're a power lifter out there, don't don't feel handcuffed to only doing the big three with, with heavy loads and think that BFR doesn't have a place for you. Um, it can be definitely be implemented into, you know, a, a well structured program. Well said. Yeah. I, um, I want to go back to you, Berto. Are there, are there certain movements where you've been like, you know, this is really well suited to BFR, but this is not, et cetera, or, or certain things. Like I remember back in the day, people were, were, were squatting, with BFR, and I was just kind of like, well, what you? I mean, if you're powerlifting, like we just talked about, sure, in the in the context mm -hmm. I gave, and probably not going to failure, and not using your traditional 40, 15, 15, I'm, I'm more just talking about instead of doing three by eight at 65%, do like three by 10 at, at 55%, you know? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. anyway, Berto, like what have you found in terms of applications for, for general training to be some, some go, no goes, or do advise, do not advise, if anything? You know what? Actually, before I dive into that, uh, there was one more scenario that I'm like, this is where BFR really shines, and that's it should have went there with the whole Arnold Weldon thing, and that's when you are at very low body fats, and mm, yep. your joints just aren't as well cushioned. So, uh, very frequently throughout like a contest prep towards the end, it's like fifty percent of my movements when the, it comes to ISOs, they're going to be uh, I'm going to use BFR. Um, and then also kind of this is this is maybe Nick you can touch up on this one a little bit but sometimes I feel that say my elbows are off by throwing on the BFR there you know obviously because I'm not trying to be stubborn and loaded but I I feel like there's a th that there's something therapeutic there and it, it, could that be because of the metabolites that you know the the lactic acid that uh, <laughs> that BFR just produces like uh, a little bit more than traditional weight training would. For sure. Yeah, that's definitely part of it. Um, but then it also goes into the conversation of what is pain, what, you know, and mm -hmm. an injury and what led up to the injury, the, the pain. And yeah. so BFR could be 
one of you know one of the many ways of 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 uh, improving the pain uh, in the elbow. But yeah, I, I would think that if you did have improvement after BFR, it could be just um, because you you like that feeling of training. So mm -hmm. BFR gives you that ability to get that feeling of training, and just that shift in mindset could alter your pain perception yeah. um or like we were kind of talking about before you turn that volume up to 11 and then turn it back down to four. Oh, four seems much better now than it did before um and pain is just a perception so if we can change that perception then i mean that's that's reducing and and uh and dealing dealing with pain so yeah definitely yeah because otherwise like usually when my elbows would go out it would be like I'm just not touching it, you know? So then I get yep. back in there like two, three weeks later and I'm like, ow, that still hurts. Whereas, you know, if I'm, you know, still doing something there. Um, yeah, I slowly am able to introduce thing, uh, the regular training back in, I think, uh, a little faster than I, I would have. Yes, yeah, similar to like changing a movement up. Like if, if rope press downs hurt and then you try like a, a V bar press down and it feels better. Okay, we mm -hmm. made a modification that now you're able to train your triceps without pain. BFR is just another one of those ways to train it. Maybe, uh, okay, so when I do my press downs, when I fully extend, I get pain in my elbow. But if I don't fully extend, it feels okay. All right, for the next week, we're going to train triceps without fully extending. Mm -hmm. Changing range of motion, changing um, uh, whatever the first example I used. They're just two, and then BFR can all be lumped together as just mm -hmm. ways to mm -hmm. modify that load within the elbow to keep it moving, keep it uh, accepting load just without provoking, provoking that pain. Yeah. It's also a nice, like positive association you get. Like yes. if you, like when you get tendonitis, it's this, every time I train, I feel pain and it gets a little worse. Every time I train, yeah. I feel pain and it gets a little worse. And it, it, um, it kind of puts the control back in your hands. You're like, all right, I'm going to induce pain in a similar area, but at a load that I know is actually, or not that I know, that doesn't induce that same pain. And now I train, I get a little bit of pain, but it's manageable, it goes away, and it's actually associated with positive outcomes. Next time I can do the same thing, but a few more reps. Oh shit, next time I can go up five pounds. Um, and I think that's, that's probably a big part of what's going on with some of the research on that pain desensitization stuff with BFR, which I think is really interesting. I know I feel like I've experienced that when I have ouchies mm -hmm. and when I do BFR. Like the next time I do it, it's a little bit better, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And, you know, it's funny. It just popped in my head. Remember when Kelly Starrett was all about flossing? Yeah. It's yeah. the same thing. You know, he would yeah. like apply like a tourniquet or a wrap to a joint and have you just move through it a whole bunch mm -hmm. and you'd feel better. So I, yeah. uh, I, yeah, not that I, uh, I'm like, yeah, see, Kelly Starr was right all along. The, the explanation for, for that, I'm sure, was, was almost almost borderline comical now if we were to look back at it. But uh, to say it doesn't work, I think I don't think we can say that, you know. I can't think of many movements where I guess BFR doesn't work super well outside of just risky stuff, you mm -hmm. know. Like, ah, um, oh, man, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I feel comfy with a leg press um, just because – it's such a big muscle and it induces so much pain when it gets like super, super burny that like sometimes it's just like, poof, okay, like your <laughs> muscles just done, you know? So I like to be able to fail on things because with BFR, it just kind of happens out of nowhere with other stuff. I can, I have a very good idea of where I'm at and where I'm going to fail. Whereas like with BFR, it's like someone just cut off the lights. And, uh, so that anything was where I was yeah. getting at homie is basically yeah. stuff that they can't crush you. If you, if you have an yeah. unexpected loss of control. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you met, you fell on a tricep extension, a curl, a hey, curl goes straight to the floor. But uh, mm -hmm. there, there's other movements where I'm like, oh, no, no, thank you, man. It's uh, it's have, for have sure a mindset. Yourself. It's a mindset going into an exercise with BFR, and if you have to almost let go of any expectations of hitting reps, hitting loads, like yeah, yeah, you have yeah. to go in there focusing on fatigue. You yeah. so it. If you can't, using BFR is not going to improve your performance. It's not going to help you lift more weight as you're doing it. Um, it's basically the opposite of what we all think or what we how we approach the gym. Like I remember going into GNC and spending $50 on something that would improve blood flow, right? <laughs> because more <laughs> blood flowing in our body, make us stronger, perform better. 
um, this is, uh, or like a, a runner wearing compression garments. That runner is wearing those compression garments to do the exact opposite of what BFR is doing. That person wants to improve their performance. So they're wearing that compression garment so that that blood goes down there and it comes back up and it doesn't pool. Um, so if we're looking to improve performance, BFR is not the way to do it. BFR, you're going to, you are essentially making yourself as inefficient as possible. You're making yeah. your, your muscular system as inefficient as possible to lift load and to lift load long. <laughs> so go into that BFR set, knowing that and understanding that, um, and just focusing on, on fatigue and have no expectation of, of sets uh, or reps. And just to kind of touch on the set and rep scheme like that 30, 15, 15, 15, similar to the limb occlusion pressure where that's not a magic formula, but it's just what's used in the studies just to standardize what we're doing across different studies so we can make some generalizations. But as long as you're doing anywhere from three to four, five sets close or at failure, you're going to get the benefit. Um, you probably don't want to fail at like five reps. You probably want to get to 10 or above um, on your on your first set. And then uh, you want to rest about 30 to 60 seconds between. If you get the same amount of reps uh, on sets after set after set, you're probably resting too long or you don't have the cuff applied correctly because you should get less reps each time. Um, that is, it's definitely something that, 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 uh, that, that should be happening, uh, when you do these, uh, when you do these sets. Yeah. You should be able to feel that acute fatigue and it should drop your performance. I noticed quite, quite markedly after the first set, especially if you're doing a higher yeah. rep set and then, and then moderate reps after that. But, um, yeah, I, I normally find I kind of defeats the purpose if I'm only getting like 10 to 15 reps, cause then I, you can still go reasonably heavy. Um, yeah. So, you know, at least for the, the times I use it consistently, it's because I'm trying to actually deload a, a joint. And I find that typically, you know, sets of 15 are, are, are still too heavy for, for that purpose. Yeah, the, the loads, we c anywhere from like 20 to 50% one rep max, anything heavier than 50%, you're kind of like, you're kind of pulling from both benefits and you're not really getting the benefits of heavy load. You're not really getting the benefits of BFR. Um, so yeah, anywhere from like 20 to 50, uh, one rep max is what, what's been kind of studied the most, but yeah, Eric, just like you're saying, if you, if you're failing at 10 or 15, it's kind of like, eh, am I really getting the benefits here? Like, or am I just trying to use a, a weight that I could just stop, stop moving my leg quickly? <laughs> yep. Well said. And I think there's one thing we should talk about before we wrap this up. And that is that, um, it's socially awkward to be far. So yeah. there's nothing like being on the far left end of the dumbbell rack where the tens are and, you know, wearing your, your sleeveless cut off and like, I'm a hardcore bodybuilder, you come in and people watch you and you're, you're failing, you know, like, oh, with, with, with the tens and you're like, Ugh! you know, and grunting pretty hard and all that good stuff. Uh, the looks I've gotten of people who are just confused um, are pretty funny and you'll get looks just from rapping because it looks weird, you know? Uh, and that, that's doing it right, or you're not purple. Man, when I used to rap and get purple, mm. I would actually try to cover it up with like a sweatshirt yeah. or pants because I didn't want people like worried about like, what the hell is this guy doing? Uh, they probably should have been because I was doing it wrong. But um, yeah, it is, it's funny because it's, it, is, it is painful and you do get a pretty ridiculous pump because of the blood pooling. Um, and it's hard to be non-vocal. So that, mm -hmm. that lunk alarm might go off. And uh, yeah, and it'll probably occur with worse than normal form, some some visible discomfort and some very light weights. So it is, uh, I think you have to leave your ego at the door. That's hilarious because like there's two things from, you know, just just being like knee deep in, into this side of fitness that um, that have gotten me in those, put me in those positions at gyms. Uh, and the first one was because we were hip thrusting and in, 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 in bridging like 10, 12 years ago. Now it's like quite normal, you know. It's just just what uh, you see a good fraction of the population at gyms do, doing that. So I remember doing that initially, and it's just like you know what, I'm just gonna go do something else because it's just <laughs> it, it never failed that someone would walk up to me and just like 
stare, like Why right you there. that bar, Rightfully bro? so, almost, right? <laughs> um, and well, and the same thing with the BFR. Like, I used to have to, just five years ago, it's changed a lot because now there's products out there that, you know, assist you with that. But I used to have to, I would go hide in the corner and I would, like, sneak it up in here. And then I would go do my, my curls because I just didn't, I didn't want to, like, talk to anyone about that necessarily. Um, well, bro, you were talking about how we used to do it in my living room. What they don't realize is this was not during COVID. We're talking like 2011. Why did we do it yeah. in my living room? It was after we came home from the gym and we would do yeah. our arm work in the living room with BFR because we didn't feel like, you know, being the spectacle and the weirdo. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting, man. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a little bit more normalized now. The other day, this was crazy. I, I, hard, I, don't, I like to like, like leave people alone when they're doing their thing. But there was a guy at the gym who literally had his cuffs on during the whole session and he was mm. lifting heavy the whole time i was looking at him he didn't take those off and i'm like is this one of this is such a moral dilemma to me because i what, what do i tell him yeah um yeah yeah so yeah read up actually Berto, this, that's man. that's good that that is um that that is a call to action for for one thing we haven't talked about yet in this podcast uh and that is uh let's kick it over to our healthcare practitioner safety how do yes. people make sure that they aren't doing this wrong and potentially endangering themselves? Who shouldn't do it? Uh, and are there things people need to consider, read up on, or um, or make sure it's not a contraindication before they try this, Nick? Yeah, that, we probably should have started with this. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll we'll just backwards. Like, I've already been doing this for 30 minutes while I'm listening. <laughs> Oh, um, Brandon edited it, so it's just we start from this side. There we go. <laughs> I'm not really uh, gonna do that, but yeah. yeah. So safety is obviously really important. Um, it just hearing about hearing about this 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 method of training it it could seem safe. It could seem scary. Like, okay, is it going to cause a blood clot? Is it going to you know how is it going to affect blood pressure, heart rate? And what we see is it actually isn't that much different than uh, regular uh, resistance training. So any precautions, any contraindications to regular resistance training are pretty much the same with BFR. Um, if, if someone has any uh, clotting disorders or blood disorders, obviously you're going to want to hold off on this. If someone has uncon uncontrolled blood pressure, um, you're probably going to want to hold off on this because it does increase blood pressure acutely but so does regular exercise. Um, it causes inflammation, just like regular exercise. Um, less muscle damage than traditional training. So that could be something um, that could be useful in like a deload or if someone is um, trying to, you know, just trying to avoid um, excessive muscle damage, then BFR can be something that's used. Uh, but real, real quick I've, on that, Nick, yeah. can I say something? Sure. I think... Most of the research on this, just for everyone to be aware, is when they're comparing similar volumes to traditional training, sometimes not matched for proximity to failure. There is some good research showing that there is less muscle damage, uh, but it's always to a comparison. What I think a lot of people do for the first time is they're used to doing like three by 10 on an exercise, and they come in and they do 40, 15, 15, 15, and they get sore as shit. And I've seen this happen a number of times, and they're like, what's going on? The research said that it should be, you know, less muscle damage. And it's like, well, even if it's less, you just did <laughs> 75 reps versus the 30 you're normally used to. So yeah, there might've been less per rep, but you're sore now just because of the over sheer, sheer amount of volume you did. So just be aware of that, that minor limitation. Anyway, carry on, Nick. Yeah, for sure. And then there's also the repeat about effect. So as you keep doing BFR training, um, and that's probably somewhere to go after the, the safety, but um, other than... Other than those main things, um, if someone, so if it's someone who's maybe an elderly uh, person, you would probably want to monitor blood pressure and, and heart rate as they're doing it somehow. Um, but other than that, for the most part, any history of a blood clotting disorder or uncontrolled blood pressure, but other than those, it's pretty much the same as traditional training as far as um, contraindications or precautions. Uh, the, the next thing that I think is important is if someone's never done BFR before and they're, they have a traditional training, uh, routine, how do we implement it? Like how, how do we start trying some of this stuff just to, how do we implement it into our training? And just like you said, Eric, you don't want to just dive in 
and and try and and go all in with this new technique and then be sore and can't train for the next week. Uh, we wouldn't do that with anything else, any other kind of any kind of training, right? So the way that we could integrate it is do all your heavy traditional training first and then tack on an isolation movement um, or not not tack on but if you are doing an isolation movement within your training throw some cuffs on with that don't approach failure um, you know keep a couple reps in reserve just get the feel of what it feels like to train with uh, restriction do that for maybe a week and then the next week Maybe we add a multi-joint exercise, maybe a leg press or maybe a hack squat, um, as well as like maybe we use a knee extension the first week. Um, again, keeping a couple of reps in the tank, we're not going to failure with BFR just yet. Uh, and then weeks three and four, perhaps now we get a little bit closer to failure. Maybe we tighten the wraps a little bit if we're measuring it somehow. Maybe we're getting now closer to the higher end of the percentage of limb occlusion. Uh, now we're getting closer to failure, but we've kind of built up the capacity to do this now, right? We've we've trained to train almost as we progress through these weeks. And then like any other training uh, method, we want to deload as well. So if you have BFR integrated into your program for four to six weeks, it's um, probably a good idea to, to, to take it out for a couple of weeks, continue with, with your normal training. And then perhaps throw it back in if you want. Um, but again, you don't have to use BFR. Um, you don't have to if, if you're making great gains and and y- there's no need to throw this in there. But if you want to give it a shot, um, if you think it sounds cool, if you are dealing with any pain um, or any kind of restrictions to load, like Alberta was saying, like the pandemic, if you're training at home, um, this could be a great little tool uh for you to implement no that's well said and just to add a couple of things um on the application of it uh there there is a reason why you will always see the cuffs themselves applied at the proximal limb so that's you know just below the deltoid or at the hip but you don't see it say for calves at the knee or Mm -hmm. at the or around the knee it's just because of how tightly compressed all the tissues there and you can get like nerve pressure that you don't want um so yeah, it's always going to be in those two spots and, and really nowhere else. If you were to talk to some of the, the experts here, it's at the hip or at the shoulder. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that that's, that's a really good summary, Nick. Um, and one thing, you know, I, I do think some forms of leg press can be good for BFR, just probably not the sleds where if mm. it did come all the day, way down, it would compress you. Like some of the, um, like the hack squat style uh, ones that that have a, a clear bottom that is you know within yeah. your range of motion, those are good, as well as like the machine leg presses, which normally I think, you know, have no place anywhere and are the devil. They're actually quite good for <laughs> for BFR. Yeah. I really don't like those those like like seated you know kind of leg press things, but they're pretty good for for blood flow restriction. Um, yeah, and I think the only other point I wanted to make and go back to was. I do really like them for certain kind of deloads, which you, we touched on briefly, Nick. Um, I think deloads, when you were ready to take a deload, when you were just crushed and you actually want to do less volume, you want to be further than uh, to, to failure, like deloads are an easy sell. But sometimes you you should take a deload, but you don't want to. Like you, you still want to get after it, but your body is holding mm-hmm. you back. And I think those are those places where, where BFR can really be helpful or help. I mean, honestly, you know, we could do a whole episode on deloads, and we have. <laughs> but ways <laughs> of making the overall trading stress lower uh, while still giving the opportunity to push hard. Um, and then you just kind of need to think about, all right, well, what do I need to deload from? And I think where BFR, like you mentioned earlier, really shines is when you need a load deload. Um, so so for sure. But uh, yeah, really good insight on not just jumping right in with unfamiliar movements because BFR or not, if you do an unfamiliar movement, you're going to get really sore. Uh, and if you do an unfamiliar movement with BFR, it's not going to cancel that out just because a few studies suggest it has slightly lower uh, potential to cause muscle damage. So, yeah. Any uh, any closing points, words, anything that you guys want to add, Nick or, or Alberto? I just want to say give it a try if you haven't. You know, it's it's uh, one of the many first aid kids that I've picked up along the way when it comes to my bodybuilding. So mm-hmm. um, something you, you never know. You never know. I had never thought I'd be using it. I was a total skeptic at some point. And now it's something that 
yeah, it's like I know it's there and it's it's been quite valuable throughout my my training career. Same. Anytime I go through a phase of, of more focused bodybuilding training, if I want to have any kind of respectable frequency on arm training, I pretty much have to use it. So. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, one thing I, I didn't mention, and this is more anecdote than anything, is I think it helps possibly with the mind-muscle connection. If maybe yeah. you can't quite find your hamstrings, you can't mm. quite find your all of your quad muscles, or you just kind of feel like you're doing knee extensions, you feel them in the same spot every time. Um just can't really feel the tricep contract like bfr one session of bfr can kind of control alt delete and like yeah. re reconnect you with uh with your muscle so that was something anecdotally that i've definitely found to be true yes yes agree that's actually a good point i'm glad you brought that up because i've noticed that as well like with traditional training especially if you trend towards like higher loads like I tend to enjoy training like six to eight rep range when I'm doing bodybuilding and I'll do, you know, some higher rep work on like machines and stuff, but you don't really get the opportunity to feel a mind muscle connection on high rep work. Mm -hmm. You're just trying to like control the load, do it right and, and practice the, and execute the movement. Um, but it is nice to be able to do BFR where you're like, you've committed to higher rep work and, and you're insured to get a pump and be able to feel every little nook and cranny of those muscles. So that is, I think, anecdotal or not, it's it's, it's something I, I, I think is a pretty obvious benefit. It's such a light load that you know if you're improvising with something else. Like I know with my BFR curl weight, I, I, I'm i like, oh, you know why? Uh, that, that it's not hurting on those reps as much is because I'm like swaying into it just enough where it's taken away from, from the biceps. So, yeah, super valuable when it comes to that. Yeah. Yeah. A lot more immediate feedback. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and then I guess one thing I, it would be a cool place to leave is where the research is going and some cool mm -hmm. things that are, are kind of in the works. Um, we're starting to see more studies come out comparing uh, contraction types. So like isometric training versus concentric training versus eccentric training. We're starting to see really cool data on comparing constant um, occlusion or uh, restriction versus intermittent where in between the sets, we un, um, uh, let the pressure go, let the blood return to the muscle, and then pump it up again, do your other set, release it in between sets. Um, initially, a lot of the research pointed to constant um, was better, and it makes sense because if we're trying to prevent the blood from, from going there and keep that hypoxic environment, if you imagine like a, a line graph of, of oxygen, every time in a in normal uh, free flow training, we we get hypoxic when we're contracting. And then when we rest, it kind of reoxygenates and then it, it, it gets hypoxic and then it reoxygenates. BFR makes sense that it stays hypoxic. So by releasing that cuff, it's almost counterintuitive that it would work. But we're starting to see some cool information that maybe that um, could be quite good. And if that's the case, if we can see similar results with intermittent BFR, now that brings down the barrier of intensity and and it, now different populations can use it. Maybe um, like we talked about the elderly a lot or the people who aren't interested in a muscle burn, right? Believe it or not, <laughs> there are people yeah. that don't like working out. So if um, if we can get those same benefits from intermittent BFR, that could be a great uh, a great way to to kind of decrease those barriers into using this uh, this training technique, and then two other really cool things would be um, uh, ischemic preconditioning, which yep. is basically yeah basically we don't have to get into this uh, it's a whole other podcast in and of itself but basically it is done prior to training. So there are, and it's passive. So maybe you're sitting in, in class or sitting at work behind your desk and you apply some cuffs. Um, you, I believe it's completely restricting. So arterial flow and venous flow for five minutes. And then you let it go for five minutes and you put it on for five minutes. And you, so you do four or five of those cycles, which would take up to 40 minutes. <laughs> um, so the practicality of it may not, may not be there, but it has shown some promising results as far as limiting strength loss during training, improving performance. Um, I don't know if a general warm up would be the same. Maybe it's just the process of getting the blood pumping, getting the muscles primed, 
uh, maybe five minutes on on our recumbent bike and then some body weight squats would do the same thing. I'm not too sure. I'm not not that well versed in in the research on that, but it is kind of coming down the pipe. And then post ischemic uh, conditioning, which would be the opposite. So use this type of comp- uh, type of uh, occlusion after training. Um, so all those things are kind of uh, coming up in the research and making a presentation on BFR is, is, is like getting hit in the face with a fire hose because it's just like every time <laughs> you open up the laptop, there's just more studies coming out. So it's, um, if you're interested in BFR, be sure to, uh, you know, follow along cause it's, uh, it's, it's a cool time, um, right now and, and the implications clinically and, and, uh, and in the gym are, uh, are, are pretty cool. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Ischemic, uh, ischemic preconditioning, and um, the the potential effects of the benefits of having that reperfusion of of blood flow to an area. Um, initially, we thought that uh, that was probably only good for vascular health and treatments in that area. But there's now some performance stuff suggesting that it has you know a carry on effect in, in blood flow delivery because of that. In fact, um, anyone who really wants to nerd out, if you want to learn more about this, and, and we'll, we won't keep going down this whole other pathway. But uh, if you go to 3dmusclejourney.com and if you click on the link to mass, uh, we actually have written a little bit about ischemic preconditioning there. Greg Knuckles has written about it. I believe the most recent one was actually just in February of this year. So just, uh, you know, a couple issues back. Um, and it was a study on how it improved performance uh, in, in weightlifting. So check it out. It's a cool, it's a cool in, an interesting idea. Uh, the title, I think, is something like uh, BFR's Weird Cousin. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting stuff. And, uh, it is a, a wacky, weird world of research when you realize what's actually being done, um, in, in this area. And it's, and it's something that's still growing. So I think, you know, watch that space. Um, it's interesting, but yeah, for now we've given you BFR. You, you can, you can carry on to, to learn more about the other stuff if you'd like. I just want to thank you, Dr. Alicameli and you, Don Nunez for being on this episode <laughs> with me. Um, hopefully this it was D O N, not D A, not the girl name, right? No, you don't. Okay, like, like, okay, just making the sure. Don Dada, you know what I'm saying? Oh, there we go. Yeah, there okay. we go. I yeah. play dominoes now. Yeah. yeah, so no worries. I got it. I got you. So, yes, thank you for joining us. Um, we hope you all enjoy whipping out your <laughs> blood flow restriction cuffs, getting a pump, getting all the blood flow into one part of your body, and just and just feeling that 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 oh so good pain. <laughs> Um, we hope it, you hope you grow from it and we hope you, you enjoy your time in the gym while everyone stares at you strangely. What's going on 3DMJers, Eric Helms here. Thanks for listening to our podcast. I just want to take a second to tell you about MASS, Monthly Applications in Strength Sport. This is a monthly research review that I put out with Greg Knuckles, Dr. Mike Zerdos, and Dr. Eric Trexler. We cover the most up-to-date, peer-reviewed research in the world of strength and physique sport that's directly relevant to your practice as a coach or an athlete. We provide our reviews in written format, but also, since you enjoy our podcast, in audio roundtable reviews where we discuss the research in depth. Finally, we also do video concept reviews where we cover a broader topic in video format for your learning. For fitness professionals, you can take quizzes on mass content and earn continuing education credits for most of the biggest certifying bodies in the fitness industry. If you want to sign up and get a subscription, head over to 3dmusclejourney.com and click on the products tab. Thanks for your time, and thanks for listening.